Hey, how are you? Good. I'm at the office working on printing things for my listing. Yeah. What are you up to? Imani, are you on here? Hey, Angela. Hi, Terry Ann. How are you? I'm terrific. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. I can't share my screen, so I'm waiting for, I just texted Imani, I'm waiting for her to give me magical access to share my screen. Of course. How is everybody? Good. Awesome. I have a closing tomorrow. My buyers have COVID, so working on that. <laughs> <laughs> First time I'm using my special step. Well, we're not yet. Hopefully we're getting a virtual closing. Can you see my computer? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So this is a class on how to prepare for your listing appointment, how to get no your problem. paperwork. You're and so your cute. <laughs> and is it okay if it's playing or do you want me to go out in another room? <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. I didn't. Um, if anybody has any questions, just 
let me know. I'll try to look at the chat box, but feel free to shout it out if I go too fast or you want me to slow down or whatever. So if you're not speaking, can you mute yourself? I hear a baby. Oh, sorry. So I have an appointment tomorrow. So I'm gonna use this as a real life example for a couple who are living in Dallas. Give me one second, I'm sorry. I thought I had her address pulled up. I was prepared, I promise, guys. Hello. Did you see what I just did? So in Realist, which is a part of FMLS, we go to the public records, Realist tax forms. We can look up people by their address or by their name. So, so as not to delay more time, I do have her name. So I can look her up that way. Last name first, comma first name. And that pulls up her and her husband's name and address. You wanna verify that the names match simply because there could be several Lisa Watleys or there could be several Lisa Watleys in Dallas. So this is the address, 109 Red Butt Lane. It's in the Seven Hills subdivision in Dallas in Paulding County. So I'm gonna take Seven Hills, the name of the subdivision, And I'm gonna take that over to FMLS. And the reason why I'm doing that is that I want to get comps for this property. She has a four bedroom home. So we're only gonna compare it to other four bedroom homes within Seven Hills. If you look down here, actually, let me take that out. If you look down towards the lower left, the number of matches in this subdivision is 152. I want to specify that it's Dallas. I brought it down to 151. I'm going to specify four bedroom homes. That's bringing it down to 62. She also has a full finished basement. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge that. We're down to 18. I'm going to come back to Realist, and I'm going to look. This says it has three bathrooms. Sometimes that can be three full baths, or it can be two and a half baths. So you want to be careful with that. What I do is just two minimum. So that'll cover two and a half as well as three. We're still at 18. That didn't change anything. I'm also going to look at the square footage, just to give an idea of range. So this house is about 2,700 square feet. Did everyone see where I got that from? Yep. Total is about 4,800, but on the main floor is about 27. So I'm gonna use a minimum 2,500 square feet. You don't have to get this specific as far as the square footage. If you have enough information with just the subdivision name, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and specifying the city, that should be enough data. But I know their house is a full finished basement and I know that um, they have a little larger floor plan. 
So Angela, quick quick question. Um, yes. So what is the sample size that you're looking for? Because I saw you kept narrowing it down to a particular number. What are you comfortable with? The first one before I narrowed it down was 18. I think that's just too much data and it doesn't encompass specifically what we're looking for. So there's no real number. I mean, if there were truly 18, four bedroom, two and a half bath at 2,700 square feet with a full finished basement, then that's just their neighborhood size. But I wanna get as specific as possible simply because this neighborhood is so big, I don't wanna compare it to houses that are not similar to theirs. If it were a smaller subdivision, Seven Hills is a huge subdivision. So if it were a smaller subdivision, I wouldn't have as many numbers to play with. And I may be able to, to get nine just by doing huh. a basement. Mm. So it just kind of depends on your subdivision as to how detailed you get. So then can I, can I counter that question then if you get to a subdivision that's smaller, how, um, how wide out do you send your range outside that neighborhood to get what, about 10? Are, are you looking for like five to 10 basically to compare? Not necessarily because this house right here, so their house number is 105 or 109 Red Butt Lane. This house here, 48 Red Butt Lane, if this were the only comp available and it was a closed sale, then that's all I would use because that's all that's available. It's on the same street. It has the same floor plan. So the likelihood that this price of 389.9 is gonna be off is really slim. Now an active I wouldn't use if it was something that closed definitely because this active, the price could go up or appraisal could knock the price down. So we don't really look at actives only as a comparison basis. So here I'm gonna do a quick CMA. I'm highlighting all nine of these properties. And if you notice with my criteria, my criteria is everything. I wanna see those expired and withdrawals simply because I wanna know why. Was it overpriced? Is it the condition? What's going on in this neighborhood? If we have lots of withdrawals and expires, I wanna explore a little deeper to find out what's happening in this area. But we don't have any, we have all sales. So I wanna take a look at some of those homes. I'm gonna highlight all nine of them and I'm coming down to do a quick CMA. Looking at the quick CMA, just the quick numbers, the average sales price is 390. Oh, nope, that's the average active. My apologies. The average sales price is 407,275. And that seller got 98% of their asking price and it took an average of two and a half weeks. Now this is going back six months worth of data so it doesn't reflect the frenzy that we have right now. So that 18 day, days on market, I'd be lucky to find a house that was 18 days on market. That was where, actually decent. Where, where are you seeing that, Angela? 18 days on market and what have you. Where's, uh, I saw the average. So the, in this far right corner, it's Oh, totally I know, my, you know what? It's blocked, that's what it is. My thumb, I gotta get rid of this. Hang on one second. Uh, okay, show me again. So on this total, on this far right column, yeah, this total days on market. Okay, yep, I see it now. My so, picture for blocking it. <laughs> we have sales price to list price percentage. That's just what this means. So if they had to do any reductions in their pricing, this is the actual sales price compared to the original list price. This is the amount that it sold for, when it sold, if that seller paid any closing cost, what the list price was. The list price may be different from the original list price. So for example, this one here that was listed at 395, originally it was at 395, they ended up lowering their price to 379.9. And then they end up closing at 386. So they lowered it, I'm assuming, Oh, they financed their closing costs. So I'm assuming what this person did is they raised the price just to be able to cover their closing costs. But these are gonna be our comps for that home. Any questions on this? 
So going in, I can say on average in this neighborhood, houses are selling for 407. And then Angela, that big one, that was 500. What happens if they ask, okay, well, you say average is 407, but how come one sold for 540? So when I go back, one of the things that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a look at when I go on my appointment. So tomorrow when I go on my appointment and I'll go ahead and do this now, I'm gonna schedule a show and to take a look at this property. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm doing that is because I wanna see in person what the competition looks like. Sure. Okay. That way, when I walk into the house, I can say this is the exact same floor plan. And they've seen this house. They know that it's just like theirs, but their basements are different. And so I can look and confidently go into this house and say, I've seen their basement. You're right. It's not like yours. And as a result, this is what we can do. Or I've seen this house and it's a completely different floor plan from yours. So I see why it's listed at this price. So I wanna look at whatever's active in the neighborhood. Additionally, I wanna look at the list and look at the sales prices. So this one that sold for 312, is sold back in August, but why did it sell for 312 when this one sold for 540? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna take a look at the pictures and see oh. what the differences are on these properties. This one has 0. 0.6 acres, it's 4,200 um, square feet. Mm -hmm. It looks bigger too, it looked like three car garage, yeah. So you wanna take a look and see what some of the differences are, are, right? Three car garage, right now we can see the exterior from the landscaping looks very nicely taken care of. They have this in the back, they have, that may have added value. So yep. you wanna just kind of get an idea of what's out there mm -hmm. and then compare the highest to the lowest to see if there's a, if there's a big range. Now, if the range was 407 and home sold from 400 to 410, not a big deal. But because we have literally a $100,000 difference swing, we want to take a look and see why. And this home that sold, it sold for cash, it took a month. So we want to have be armed with that information because they may know the neighborhood. They may know that house and say, well, what's the difference between that house and mine? And you can go back and say, well, that backyard or that basement or that outdoor kitchen area. Here, I don't know if you saw where I went. So here's a little clock and it tells you the listing history. So this house went on the market August 13th. It went on originally for 565. They did a price reduction to 555 almost a month later on September 9th. And then they went under contract four days later. So if you have someone that wants to overprice, you can say they stayed on the market for a month before they got an offer. And when they put it to the right price, it took four days for them to get an offer. Do you want to wait an extra 30 days to get under contract and pay an extra month worth of mortgage and utility and property taxes, or we can price it right and get you under contract in a couple of days? So I always check the listing history for properties as well, just to kind of get an idea. Did they go on and off the market several times? That could be an indication of problems with the home. Um, for this, the longest sale was 44 days. So you wanna look at that and say, okay, why did that one take 44? Again, we're in a different market. And so the likelihood that we'll see a house on a market that's been on for this long, but just in general for regular real estate, anything that's been on the market a lot longer than others in the neighborhood, take a look at the history. After you look at the pictures and try to see if you can piece together story there. And if you can't, they know specifically about the property. They may not give you details, but they'll say, oh yeah, we had a foundation issue and we had to keep coming back on the market. Well, then you know that that has nothing to do with the neighborhood, specifically with that home. And so once I have my... Oh, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, did you say, I'm sorry, I got back on a second ago. 
you or go look at a house that's priced 500,000 or whatever to okay. compare, but what okay. if, are, are you talking about ones that are already closed or are you talking about like- Right now there's only one active house on the market and I scheduled time to see that house before my appointment. Awesome, got it, thanks. And I walked through that house for the purpose of seeing what the comp com um, competition is. This house just came on the market yesterday. They're not ready right now this is a walkthrough to tell them what they need to do in order to get ready. But if they were ready right now, I wanna know if this house goes, if I have a photographer come out on Wednesday and we list on Thursday, who are we competing against? Especially on the same street. And that way I know what features to highlight on mine or what features we need to work on. Like if, if their yard looked like this, then that's a, a shoe in. If the neighbor's yard was brown and, and I mean, it's time of year, but you wanna look at the differences between what's on the market and what you're selling. You always wanna know the inventory in the neighborhood of what you're selling. It just shows that you are, are working, you know the neighborhood, you know the ins and outs, you know where the pool is. Just make sure that you take time and drive around that community, see what's active just to be on the now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I'm using this as a guideline. I'm not giving my seller a Matt. price, but I'm giving them a range so that they have an idea. Uh, tablet, uh, mm -hmm. So they have an idea of what the price range should be based on the homes that have sold in that community. Another place that I go to get value is RPR, Realtor Property Resource. And we can take an address in here. And here you need to know the address and not, um, you can't look up the homeowner by the name. I take the address, I drop it in RPR, and RPR is going to give me several different types of reports. This is going to be specific. They're going to give a value of 378,000. And it's saying the range here is 344 to 412. So it's kind of where we are with our CMA. I'm sorry, Angela, could, where did you go to RPR? I, what is that? Did you put in RPR? Or did that link you right to Keller? Or, or can we go through that through intranet for Keller Williams? No, so RPR is a separate site. We all okay. have access to it. We pay into it. So okay. if you go into Google and just type in RPR, uh -huh. Realtor Property Resource will come up. Okay. And then as a first time user, you're going to have to put in your NERS number, your NRDS, mm -hmm. and your MLS login, mm -hmm. and it'll pull data from the MLS. It only pulls from one MLS, but it'll pull data from the MLS and give you those numbers. Okay. So this is giving me a 378, 379. It gives me the range. It confirms the buyer's name or the seller's name, their square footage. It does not include the basement. Here it says that it's a three bedroom, three bath. So you wanna do this. And what I do, I'm using both and going back and forth. Tax records show something different. Tax records, according to here, say show that it's a four bedroom. Sorry, that was a realist. Actually, tax records show that it's a three bedroom. So she says three, the MLS, I mean, she says four, the MLS says four, the tax records show three. So what I'm looking for is when I get to her house to see if that fourth room is a fourth room or a fourth bedroom. If it has a window and a closet and egress, because she may have turned another room into a bedroom that really isn't a bedroom. And in which case my numbers would be wrong. 
So based on a three bedroom, it's given a value of 378. If she truly has a four bedroom, then her value will go up to that average of 407. Do you guys see what just happened? Any questions about that? So there's a discrepancy with what the tax record says and what the MLS says. I'm just gonna go by what she told me. So I'm gonna go by a four bedroom. And when I sent, give her this report that says 378, I'll explain to her that it is based on it being a three bedroom, not a four. So I got a question, Angela. Just say you go there and it is actually a four bedroom. It has mm -hmm. egress, what have you. Would, would you then somehow change, how does it get changed on the tax records then, just in case if then now you have a buyer coming in and they're like, well, it's only on the tax records, it only says three bedroom. Like how, how does that get changed? I, when they change their square footage and the number of bedrooms, I believe it triggers the county to change their taxes as well. Right, yeah. And I don't get into the business of telling people how to change their taxes. Okay. Because there may be back taxes that they owe as a result of the county not knowing their true size. And I, I don't, I don't want to trigger. So you don't say anything. You just, but, but when you go to list the house, you will put a four bedroom. I will list it as a four yeah. bedroom. It's, okay. If it's a four bedroom and then in the special, in the private remarks, I'll say tax records are wrong. Okay. Okay. It, is, it can be a lot more cumbersome with going to the county and changing tax records. And in doing so, you can add in additional taxes. I don't know enough about it to, to advise someone to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. So I'll list it according to what it is and then just make mention. If it was a square footage difference, I would say tax records are off based on appraisal or based on whatever new information they have. Okay. So when we do, when we're in here, we're going to create a report and RPR is going to ask you what type of report you want to create. Is that better? So we can do a seller report. We can do a property report. Um, we can do a property flyer, market activity, a neighborhood, school. So depending on what your purpose is, I'm usually in here to do a property report or a seller report. Oh. Once you're in here, these are the things that will be a part of that report. So the subject property and its values, some facts about the home and homeowner, pictures. If it's a, a recently expired listing, it's going to have the most recent pictures from the MLS. Because this is pulling from the MLS, whatever data that is grabbing is going to be in here. If it's an active listing, you're going to see the active pictures that are on here. You can have this report sent directly to your client. So you can put in their name and their uh, email address and it'll send directly to them. I usually download it so that I can print it. If I wanna send it to them, I can, but it's a lot of information as I'll show you in a second. And a lot of times, unless they're a high D and really like numbers, they're not gonna look at it or know what they're looking at. So I create, create the report, it takes a couple of minutes and then I'll get a notification that that's ready. I'll print this as well, so that we have an idea of what's been selling in the neighborhood specific to their home. And then I'll also print the, uh, the active, because this is the only home that would be their competition. So I'll print this so that they'll see what the neighbor is selling, just in case they've never been in this house. So I'll go ahead and print the buyer sheet and then on the back, I'll have all the photos. Any questions about that? This is Angela, I have a question. 
I have a question. This is Allison Gale. What's the furthest you would feel comfortable going back for days um, when you're doing your FMLS um, comp search? So realistically, I'm going to give you two answers. In a normal market, I'll do the six months because that's a good indication of where the, the sales have been trendy. In this market, I would probably go back 30 days. Okay. So here, let's see how that changes if we look at 30 days. Barnesville. And the only reason why I say 30 days is because things are going so quickly that that may be enough time to get some information. In 30 days, so, so that would be too, that wouldn't be far enough back. So maybe 90 days. We've had two sales in the last 90 days. So it's not a lot. Most of the sales happened um, last summer. So to answer your question, will really depend on the, the data that's available. If there are a lot of sales in the last 30 days in this hot market, I would use that. But on average, we're looking at six months. And the reason why I tell people six months is because typically that's what an appraiser is looking at as well. So I wanna be in the same line of looking at, at comps that an appraiser would look at as well. And I'll tell the buyer or seller that the way that I'm looking at it, I'm trying to mimic what an appraiser does so that we can come up with the same numbers for value. It'll be interesting to see how the appraisals and the sales will look six months from now because of the bidding wars that are going on. Really, is, there's, there's very few comps to support the prices that our properties are going under contract for now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a, um, this is just a one-off, very personal question to my situation, but I was kind of doing a market evaluation for, um, I don't know, a contact. And he told me there were a lot more, there was a lot more activity in his neighborhood than FMLS was showing. And when I went back kind of to do some searching on the map, I did find a lot of closed sales that were not showing on FMLS. Have you encountered that? And how do you kind of incorporate these kind of off boat quiet listings. What um, what town? Well, it's in Dunwoody, so it was uh, Briar North. Oh, okay, that's surprising. So we have two MLSs, FMLS and Georgia MLS. Mm -hmm. Typically on the south side of town, they don't put information in FMLS. So if you're looking in, let's say Ellenwood or Douglasville or one of those areas a little further away, they will only list in Georgia MLS. And so Georgia would be your better place to go. Everybody lists in Georgia, but not everybody lists in FMLS. So if there's a situation like that, I would check with Georgia MLS to see if there's some additional cops. Um, just because we have two different MLSs that people use. Does that make sense? You're muted. Yes, yes, sorry. Thank you, that does make sense. But then I also see kind of postings for quiet listings and I really assume that's off MLS. Um, in this market, are people making deals outside of? Agents? I'm sure there's always gonna be um, off, off market home sold for sale by owner home sold and those don't ever hit the MLS. And so what we can do there, let me see. Anybody have any questions about what I've done so far? I'm gonna shorten my screen. I don't mean to take this too far off topic. So, you know, I could come back to you outside of this call. No, that's perfectly fine because um, this may be a question somebody else has. This is what I use, not maybe real list, but I think the property map and I went parcel by parcel to look to see what the information said. So you can click on it and it'll show you what, um, when it closed last. It's gonna be very specific. So unfortunately there's no way to safeguard from it so that you, 
I mean, everything that we're doing, we're trying to show competence in our ability as a realtor to pull information. And unfortunately, we're going to have some off-market listings that we just won't have access to. Does it influence your evaluation? It will, um, based on those numbers. So if, if a client says, we have more than what you told me, more than what you presented, then do your research and then say, you know, that may or may not have an effect, simply because if it's not listed, then that means an appraiser won't see it as well because it's an off-market sale. And so there may be circumstances where there is a property that sold for hire that was never in the MLS that, the, that would be a good comp for you. And so you want to know what those homes are because you want to show the appraiser that because they won't have access to it because it's off-market. Yeah, thank you. That was a good point. So what I did in Realist, and again, we go to Realist from public records, Realist tax. In Realist, you have your quick search and you have your personal search. You can put in a personal search and select the subdivision that you want. Select from list. This is Seven Hills and Seven Hills is a really big subdivision. So this is all the sales data in Seven Hills. You have 1,094 matches. We want to filter down based on what we did before. So we can do it by square footage. We can do it by recording date, year built. I won't go too far into it because I don't want to take us off, but here's where you can go to look at everything that's happening in the neighborhood. And you can specify it according to the information that you need. So if you're only looking for actives, if you're only looking for pending. It'll give you that information. And you can play around in here. And, and if you have an address, you can go directly to that address and pull up the details from that property. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. That's one way to go. Yeah. So once we have our report, it's gonna show an aerial view of the home. information from that first page. And then we get into some, some nuts and bolts that only people who like data like. So don't feel obligated to go line by line with these because it is a lot of information. It gives you about the school. The history of prices in this area in Paulding County for this house, for the zip code and for Georgia, when they bought the house, what they bought it for. I mean, it's a wealth of information in here. You can really find as much or as little as you want to help support your pricing. And, and this is all this is for, is to help support the numbers that you're coming up with so that when the seller agrees to a sales price, they feel confident that they're agreeing to the correct price and that you've done your research to know why. So I'll print this report. And you could also, once you have it printed, you can go back in and say, okay, well, maybe I want something about the property, but I don't want it to include neighborhood stats or economic stats. I, I don't want that information. You can uncheck this list and it'll print without that information. So you can pick up different types of, of reports. You can do different types of report. You can have it emailed, you can download it, you can manipulate it however you want. So I'll print that. I print out the uh, comp sheet. I print out the CMA. 
We can also get the tax record that I pulled up before. And as much information again to show that you're competent in, in this area. For some counties, um, you can get the deed for free. So if you wanna print a copy of the deed, again, to verify the names that are on there, I have a client who I spoke with the husband, but he's not the owner of the property, his wife is. So I wouldn't have known that had I not gone to the tax records to realize that. He's not the decision maker. He is the point of contact, but all decisions have to be through her because she's the true owner of the property. So you definitely wanna verify that you're speaking to and dealing with the proper people. The two of them together is who you're having your interview with, your appointment, but just keep in the back of your head, she is the one that has to sign, not him. And then in command, She's a new lease, so she's not in command. Do you guys know how to pull your um, docs from command? Do you need me to show you that? I have no problem if you need me to show it to you. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, just in case, just go ahead. Yeah. Be great. Thanks, Angela. So I'm gonna do this just like you would do with a brand new person. So I'm putting her, her contact information in. Mm -hmm. No, I asked Demi Carter. Hold on. Didn't mean to do that. She's gonna be a lead. I'm gonna add her to my pipeline. You create whatever tags you want. So I'm going to go back to contacts and look for her. Now, if I wanted to put her on a smart plan, this is where I would go to do it and just pick which smart plan I wanted to put her on. We have our appointment tomorrow and that's when I'll gauge um, how ready she is. If she'll be ready in two weeks or if it's gonna take her two months because she has repairs and things extra that she has to do. So I'm not gonna do a plan yet because I really don't know what plan to put her on until I figure out where she is. I want to go ahead and add in her address. So go to add more information. Oh, sorry. And the reason why I wanna add in her address twofold, because I want it to populate when I print her docs, but also want to have the uh, mar monthly market report available when the time is ready to put her on a plan. So her neighborhood popped up, Seven Hills. We're gonna create an opportunity. This is a listing. That's the buyer's name. Actually, there is a co-seller, so I have to add his name into there as well. I created these tasks for myself so that I know what stage my clients are in. So we have the um, appointment schedule and right now I'm preparing the CMA and the paperwork. 
and then going to create the list, um, custom listing presentation. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that just so that I know where I am in my face. And then we're going to go to, so our seller profile is already built. We're going to go to documents. Under pick checklist type, this is residential. So what I want to make sure that I have with me, the house was built, I think it was 2004, so we don't need the lead based paint exhibit. But we do want to have the disclosures, community association and seller property disclosure. If you pulled up the warranty deed, you want to have that. The wire fraud disclosure, the affiliated business disclosure, and then our listing point, our listing agreement. We're going to start a transaction in DocuSign. And I'm going to add the documents from DocuSign Forms. We have a listing folder already designated. From this listing folder, I'm going to add in the community association disclosures, the listing agreement. You also want to make sure you're giving your sellers the uh, proper pamphlets for how to protect themselves as sellers. So that will be printed as well. So we have the seller property disclosure, community association disclosure, and the uh, listing agreement. But we also need our KW forms. So I'm gonna go back to add DocuSign forms. And we're gonna go to our office is 178. That's our office number. So I'm gonna get the affiliated marketing disclosure and the wire fraud prevention and add those as well. Angela, can I ask one question? Yes. For, um, if, for the listing, um, if you get it, do, do we provide um, a home warranty while it's on the market? I know. Well, that's, that's a great point and that's a selling feature that I add into the um, listing appointment, uh -huh. letting them know that as soon as we go on the market, well, as soon as they sign the listing agreement, that's when I order the home warranty. It's free to them at no cost. Yep. And you put the pre-listing warranty on every home. Okay. I use 210, you can use whomever you want, but yes, you will go ahead and, and in the folder that I'm presenting, I have termite inf information and home warranty information as well. Okay. That way, if they need to do a termite letter because the buyer's requesting, they have information on who they can possibly go to and then information on um, 210 in the event that they wanna use it to buy. So this is where all the documents are. You go and you fill it out and then you send it off for signing. What I, would, what I do for my appointments, I print all of these as well as leave it into the loop so that I can explain it to the buyer as their, uh, excuse me, the seller while we're there. So I wanna have a physical copy while we're there so that one, they can take it and read it, but also one that I can get them to sign at the appointment and then come back and upload it into the loop. It's a lot easier to get them to sign there as opposed to waiting for, for you to fill this out and sending them the link to sign. Some may need to read it beforehand and ask questions and then get back to you where they will sign electronically, but it's always a good idea to be prepared and have this available so that um, you're ready to go at the appointment. Any questions? We wanna have all of our documents. Like I said, I also make sure that I'm bringing the warranty information termite information, anything that's extra you're adding as a part of your 
them using you, bring it to the appointment, have it in a nice folder. Um, you're pulling all of your comps, you're searching the neighborhood, you're checking out other homes that are listed that are close to theirs. Now, for example, I'm gonna close out of there. If there were a property that did not have um, comps in the area, let's say there were no sales, comparable sales in a, in a subdivision. Um, I'm gonna give you two examples. I sold a home in East Cobb. It was a ranch built in the 60s. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. Completely unlike any other house in the area. Here we go. You see my screen? Okay. So this is the house. Two it's a two bedroom, two bath ranch in East Cobb. But that's what the inside looks like. It was gorgeous on the inside. So typically when we think of East Cobb, we only think of two bedroom houses. We're thinking that were built in the 60s. We're thinking of something that's old and dilapidated and has no value. And when I did a search, the only thing that I could find comparable was in city of Marietta or in Smyrna. I did a search of all of Cobb County and could not find any comps because this house was over 2000 square feet. It was only two bedrooms and two bathrooms. There was no way to make an additional room. It had a one car garage. It was a ranch. I mean, you name it, that was an anomaly. That's what this house had. I wanna show you the, the neighbor's home. So it wasn't in a subdivision that was only two bedroom, two bath ranches. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Hampton Oaks, but this is what the neighbor's houses look like. That's that one. But they were all four and five bedrooms built in the last 10 years two car garages, 4,000 square feet, completely not the same as this house. So what I advised my client to do was a pre-list appraisal. And what that is, I came up with numbers based on the location, the price, what it had done to the house and what it would take for one of those older homes to look like that. And my number was around 275, 275, 280. And it took a long time for me to come up with that number. But to prove value to him, and if you have a house that's an anomaly, um, I offer a pre-list appraisal and they have the appraisal come out before the listing goes live. The appraiser gives their valuation. They have a deeper system than what we have. He gives his valuation and we use that as a backup in the private remarks. I should have it in here. In the private remarks, we, we put that it was backed up by an appraisal. So there's no rebuttal from an agent. And we went on a contract in, in two days. Coincidentally, for someone who was looking for something very similar to this. But with the pre-list appraisal, I offered to pay half at closing. So they're getting some of their money back and they're getting the price closest to what a professional was saying. And I am only out $250, $300 at closing so that I make sure that we actually take this thing all the way through. Um, I've had this on houses that had, oh, this one also had half an acre of land, completely unique to East Cobb. I've also done houses that had a lot of land where the house wasn't as nice, but the land was valuable. And I, I again, that pre-list appraisal is is heavenly because you're putting it off on the appraiser to come up with a valuation. But if it's in a neighborhood that has comps, 
find the comps. But if it's such a unique house and does not match anything else, offer that pre-list appraisal. You're only out $250 when they close. That's the key. If there's other comps, so one of the things that I did to, to find comps for this, again, this is in Sprayberry. I started out in a subdivision. There's no other two bedroom homes in a subdivision. And then I went a mile search. So I looked for two bedroom, two bath homes that were more than 2,000 square feet within a mile of that, 80, of that address. I get nothing. So then, okay, well, maybe if we go three miles, what will that pull? Nothing. So then we go 10 miles and see what that pulls. That gave me 15, but 10 miles away from East Cobb is a whole heck of a lot of places that are not comparable to East Cobb. We have Woodstock, we have Canton. Canton prices are not gonna be similar to East Cobb prices. Um, Woodstock schools are not the same as Sprayberry, Sprayberry schools. So I, I take that with a grain of salt if we have to go out that far. 10 miles is too far. So then I tailor it back. I'll say, okay, we didn't have anything in three. We had a lot in 10. What's in five? There's one in five. That was at 425 in downtown Woodstock. So then I look at this property and see, does it look, well, no, it doesn't look like mine. So if you do... If you exhaust all avenues and you can't find anything, go to the professional. But that's how I would start. I'll start with a number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. And because this one, most two bedroom, two bath are like 1200 square feet. By this one being so big, I had to put in a square footage. Otherwise I would get a lot of smaller properties that were comparable. Um, you can also do it by, by price. If you know 400 is just way out of price, then I would do zero to 350 and see what comes up. And just play around with the numbers until you get something that's comparable in size, location, and uh, as close to price as you can get. But here's where you play around with it. And you take a look at the pictures, you look at all the details to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. Any questions? There's a lot of different tools that we can utilize in order to find information. It's just a matter of taking the time to, to do the work to find it. Um, something else I was gonna show you. Those are the major things that I use in order to, to, to prepare for a listing appointment. You want to have your paperwork so they can sign and you want to do your background information to find out price valuation. Um, another thing that I've done is have like a little Q&A available for the seller while I'm walking the house. And it just kind of gets them letting you know um, if they take on any home equity loans, what they think the value is now, what they think their loan balance is. Um, you may wanna get information like name and ages of kids and pets for future marketing. So you can add tabs and command. Anything extra that you can kind of get them to fill out in the beginning is a good idea to have that. And I give that to them as I'm walking the house. I prefer them not to walk with me when I walk into the house. I wanna walk as if, and I let them know, I'm, I'm walking around as if I have a buyer with me so I can see things through the eyes of a buyer. And that way, as I'm looking through the eyes of a buyer, I can see things that you walk past several times. And because you see it all the time, you don't even realize that dent in the wall or that broken doorknob or the glass that's frosted. You see it every day, so you just it's just a blind spot now. But I can walk in and see it with a fresh set of eyes and give you an idea of what you may need to do in order to get the biggest bang for your buck. 
And so while I'm walking, should only take two, two to three minutes, depending on the size of the house, they're filling out that questionnaire because it's just something, a filler for them to do until I get back. That's it, that's about it. Uh, thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much, Angela, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank Angela. You. And if you have any questions, just Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Useful. Thank you, Angela. If you have any questions, just let me know. I'm always around the office. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, have a great Angela. day. You too.